afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Sizing Up Summer Gasoline Demand. My name is Shannon Folken, and I lead the energy marketing team here at DTN. We're excited to have all of you here today, and we have a lot to cover. So I'm going to roll through housekeeping items fairly quickly and then introduce our speaker. So first, you'll notice that everyone is muted. We are leaving time at the end to answer questions, so we encourage you to submit those through the Q&A window in the bottom right-hand side of your screen. We're planning on a 40-minute presentation followed by a 20-minute Q&A session, and we'll get to as many questions as we can in the time we have allotted. And after this event, we will be sending out the rebroadcast link via email, and it'll also be available on our DTN.com website. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Brian Milne, who is a 25-year veteran of the energy industry and has held many roles in his tenure, including editor and analyst here at DTN. Brian has delivered presentations on a wide range of topics and has been quoted widely in the media. He has authored numerous articles for international magazines, exploring market dynamics and providing forward thinking commentary and analysis. Today, he's gonna to be walking us through the current gasoline landscape and expectations for driving demand during the summer season. Brian, over to you. Well, thank you, Shannon, and good morning or good afternoon, depending on wherever you're seated. Um, I'm very you know, pleased to be here to look at uh, the gasoline picture. Um, something that we all care about. Um, there's a few few moments, you know, I've been in the uh, energy industry in one, side, in one fashion or another for the past 25 years. Um, certainly have seen many things in the past year uh, has uh, certainly brought uh, new developments uh, that uh, are hard to predict and certainly something to, uh, to discuss and, um, and review. Um, I head up a team that looks at the markets. We provide price analysis. Uh, we look at, we provide market commentary, relevant news and analysis. So that's what I do. I have a great team and um, I'm thrilled uh, to be here, like I said, um, to talk about the gasoline market. So let's take a look at our agenda. Um, what we're going to discuss today, we're going to start out by looking at, you know, the gasoline market disposition, you know, how is supply and demand balanced right now? Um, then we're going to take a look at you know, what your historical drivers of gasoline demand are, and we'll take a look at those numbers, and then move to something that's been more of a recent, uh, I guess it's been around for a few years, and that, but more of a recent uh, focus with high-frequency data, you know, providing more of a closer to real-time statistics. And then we're going to compare that also with our, the real-time trends that we see through our proprietary refined fuels demand data, and we'll move from there to what to expect during the summer demand uh, season. And uh, from there, and I'll offer a price outlook. Um, so first, let's go to you know, where's demand. Um, and as we can see here, you know, uh, the red line is showing um, it's moving up, and that's good news. Um, Gasoline demand is strengthening. In fact, yesterday, the EIA reported that last week, gasoline demand moved above 9 million barrels per day for the first time since August, and actually only for the second time since the pan pandemic-induced lockdowns that occurred um, last March. Um, this trend is bolstered, you know, certainly by the end of some business restrictions and uh, progress in vaccines. Um, we have improving market sentiment. Also, the Easter holiday in early April lends some support as well. Um, but you can see where we're coming from, uh, pretty depressed levels. In fact, over the first two months, um, the Federal Highway Administration, uh, in fact, this came out yesterday as well, reported that uh, during January and February, um, as you can see, gasoline demand was down, or vehicle miles traveled, excuse me, were down nearly 12% um, against a year ago. And of course, January, February, a year ago was uh, the uh, you know right before the pandemic. Um, so that's and now we'll now we'll take a look over at the supply side, and this is interesting. Um, 
you know, gasoline stocks right now are, are, are more than 6 million barrels or 2.6% below normal for this time of year. So that's a bullish uh, dynamic. However, when you start looking a little closer at the numbers, you know, since the beginning of the year, there's only been four weeks in which gasoline demand drew, you know, was, was declined. Now, of course, we are typically in a building season uh, where supply builds before it's drawn down during the summer. But if, if, if we if we didn't have the situation with winter storm Uriah, um, supply would have been you know, well above the historical average. During the two week period from late February to early March, uh, we, we had you know, two, uh, a two week period where more than 25 million barrels of, of, of gases, gasoline supply was drawn down. And you can certainly see that. Um, if, uh, if you've been following the news, I'm sure if you're in the business, uh, you're aware that, you know, in February, we had a very unusual winter storm event. Um, during that time, uh, the, the Gulf Coast run rate um, fell as low as 40.9% uh, for a week, and it stayed depressed for quite a while. Um, you know, the ice, uh, the ice storms, uh, freezing temperatures in an area, you know, Texas that's unaccustomed to such such weather events really caused some serious problems uh, for refinery runs. In fact, Valero came out today reporting some, some high costs for energy uh, during that time, uh, hurt, by, hurt by the outage. Um, now, you know, why is this significant? Of course, Gulf Coast is the uh, area with uh, you know, the largest refining con concentration of refineries in the United States. In fact, there are 57 operating refineries in the Pad 3 with nearly 10 million barrels per day of capacity. Um, that accounts for 52.6% of the total U.S. refining capacity. So that steep draw uh, down um, is because of that, uh, courtesy of the, supply, uh, the weather event disruption. Um, we could probably send a whole webinar on that, but let me move forward and you know, even before, you know, uh, Uriah wreaked havoc on the refining industry down the Gulf Coast, we saw refiners responding um, to the pandemic, uh, you know, induced demand losses by with, with some pretty strong discipline. Um, what you're looking at in the bottom, you know, chart is just the production rate of gasoline for refiners. And of course, we can see with that blue line being a year ago, you know, how how you know how they, you know, they 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 tamped down production pretty strongly because of all the lost demand uh, at, at that period of time. Um, but what also is also occurred is over this period, refiners and this is in the top graph have lightened their crude slate. Um, they've actually been doing this for a bit of a while, and that why I'm bringing that up is that actually means they're producing more gasoline as opposed to diesel. Um, the concern uh, in, in, in producing too much diesel is that, you know, jet demand is down you know, dramatically and they did not want to create a glut. So not only were they trying to restrain overall uh, production of, of, of any sort of product, so they didn't prevent, you know, didn't create these uh, enormous gluts like we saw, you know, find, uh, following the great financial crisis. Uh, um, they, they, they practice some pretty serious discipline and also move to lighten the, uh, the lighten the crude slate. That yellow bar in January, this is delayed data from the EIA. Um, that is a record high in, 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 uh, in light crude being used, consumed by, uh, by U.S. refiners. Um, so, but as we see uh, in last week, um, if I back for this last week for the second week, we're finding. Uh, run rates are at 85% capacity, so they are expanding, and we are seeing now that uh, you know, gasoline production is moving higher. Um, so when we when we go you know, and we look at this, we put this together. We you know a good way of trying to understand your your overall disposition is, is really understanding you know how many days of forward supply you have, and, and these are calculations, of course. Um, but you're looking at, you know, what's your current demand, what's your current inventory level, production level, and you're, you're to, to size up where, you know, where you are, are at. So in other words, you know, how many, if you just stop producing, you know, how many days of supply would you have? And of course, you know, the big bump from a year ago, uh, not to be, uh, you know, not something unexpected. But what occurred, you know, the combination of the steep draws, um, 
created by you know, Winter Storm Uriah. And the discipline of uh, refiners in, in limiting the overall growth in inventory, uh, joined by you know now increasing demand growth, um, has has pushed you know the days of forward supply you know below the three and five year averages. That's a bullish signal, of course, but it does mask some weaknesses. So if you you know just to you know, to hold the applause, I would say is that you know if 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 refiners, you know, up their their runs, um, you know, and demand, you know, flatlined, if we didn't see too much more growth, in those days of forward supply would start growing again. So I, I it's 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 this is a positive development certainly um, for the industry, um, but certainly there are some there are some bumps in the road, uh, which is a great time to move to some of our, you know, traditional economic drivers. Um, and of course, you know, employment is, you know, key to, to, to uh, understanding, you know, uh, gasoline demand. Um, unemployment, you know, you have some stats up there, but just to run off a couple others, um, you know, unemployment claims, they are trending down. The Department of Labor uh, came out uh, this morning reporting 547,000 initial filings. Of course, this is a high number. I mean, we were at 225,000 before the pandemic struck, but still that is the best number we've seen um, on a weekly basis in over a year. Um, and, and it's a second, a second week in a row with claims below 600,000. Uh, so that's good news. Um, more individuals are being hired monthly, which is also great. And, um, Earlier this month, the Department of Labor came out with their monthly uh, employment situation report uh, showing um, that the national unemployment rate was 6% in March, and that compares with 14.8% in April of last year. Pretty, pretty big decline. Um, and this is certainly great progress. Uh, but, you know, now if we just take a quick look at uh, some of those bullets I have on the slide there, you know, the first one, we have 4 million individuals unemployed in March who in February 2020 had a job. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, you know, some weakness right there. Um, the Labor Department also told us earlier this month that the number of individuals employed are down 8.4 million since the pandemic. And now all of a sudden, some of these data points seem at odds with each other, right? So, um, and there are, when you look at some of this data and you start digging into it, there, there may seem some contradictions. So it's, so it's important to understand, you know, some of, you know, what the Department of Labor, um, what they're reporting. And when we talk about that 6% unemployment rate, you know, we're looking at one of six ways in which the Department of Labor review that data. Um, the measure, it's the official rate, uh, is the U3 employment rate, which we just stated. Um, and the U3 uh, survey uh, measures the total unemployed as a, present, uh, as a percent of the civilian labor force. So to be counted in this, you would have had, you would have needed to have sought work over the most recent four week period. So, uh, so what happens is those numbers can decline, but might not mean necessarily that the individual who, you know, is, you know, that, that, that is no longer being counted actually has a job. Um, and uh, so that's something to understand. Um, and as you can see on the chart with the line, um, that the labor participation rate has declined since the, uh, since the pandemic. And this is certainly understandable. Uh, there's certainly a number of people who have, you know, or, or who now need to stay home to care for children or elderly or have COVID or, you know, one issue or another. Um, but the labor participation rate, which was trending higher before the, uh, the, the, pre, uh, the pandemic struck, you know, was down 1.8%. Um, and expectations are for that labor participation rate to stay stubbornly in the area it's at. Because they're not expecting to see a big increase um, in that. Um, so that is um, unfortunate. Um, now, another way, if we look back at, if we look at their chart for histogram, um, where we have those gold or yellow or orange bars, wherever they are, a little colorblind there. So, but um, the non-blue ones, maybe we'll say, um, that it looks at the unemployment rate through the U6 uh, series. And uh, that was 10.7% in March. Um, 
and down you know, from 22.9% in April 2020. Now, the U6 rate includes marginally attached workers, um, and those individuals working part-time for an economic reason, but would rather would prefer to work full-time. Um, so, so that so that shows that there's still a lot of slack in the markets. There's still people that you know are, are you know while they're not being counted in the U3 segment, they they're not satisfied with the work. They need more. They're not you know not covering bills, uh, whatever. It is certainly um, you know a, a, an issue for for those individuals. Um, but it does show there's a lot of still a lot of slack in the system as well. Um, and you know the reality of all of this is that you know the numbers are while while employment you know what we've seen in employment is certainly historic you know the, the growth in new jobs is certainly wonderful but we took an enormous hit last year which is also another historical event um, and the, the rea reality of this is that gasoline demand is going to be limited um, or should, should I say the growth in gasoline demand is going to be limited going forward until more more people find work. And that now we shift, and this this might seem a little you know contradictory when we start looking at you know what I just said about you know there's there's still a whole bunch of people uh, that want to work that, that that can't seem to find jobs. Um, you know another 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 dynamic we look at is discretionary spending. Um, discretionary spending, you know, exploded higher in March, right? And uh, you can see that with the uh, you know, with the you know how the trend is going uh, with the gold bar, um, the percent on, on the right side. Um, now, this with with what I just indicated with the unemployment situation, this shouldn't really be happening. We shouldn't be seeing such a a strong um, you know uh, such, such, such strong discretionary spending. I mean, let's just face it. You know, you don't spend like a drunkard sail, sailor if you don't have a job. Or are worried about job security, right? But you know, as we all know, there's been extraordinary spending by the federal government over the past year, including direct deposits right into the accounts of millions of Americans. And so this has blurred the correlation. Um, we can certainly see the 18.3 spike a year ago in May 2020, um, as uh, you know, after the initial shock of the lockdowns and um, all the store closures. And um, but then if we look. Uh, we we could also see that after you had a lackluster holiday season in sales, uh, which really did disappoint, uh, spending surged again in January. Um, it was up 7.7 percent, and that followed the disbursement of $600 payments to uh, to uh, to individuals. February's fall off. I think a lot of that could be blamed on the weather. I mean, it was uh, not only the Texas and surrounding areas. I mean, I'm forgetting there's all these people in Oklahoma and Kansas and elsewhere. Um, just how how terrible the weather was. But the weather was harsh in, in, in large swaths of the country. So it wasn't just that region, and that's going to certainly depress spending. Um, but then now we see this big spike in March, um, and guess what? Everybody knows, you know. $1,400 checks were issued. If uh, I get the number right, I think with 80% of uh, of individuals received uh, $1,400 payments, and people are spending. Uh, this trend is expected to continue as the number of vaccinated individuals continue to grow, and more people feel safe signing out. So we'll watch this uh, number, and let's take us to our next slide. Which relates as well, consumer sentiment. You know, it's you know, it really is you know a combination of you know you're feeling good about your uh, about your job, about your financial situation, your job security. You know, you're willing to spend more. Um, you know, and we can see that that's trending higher after taking a major hit um, because of the pandemic. Um, and of course, part of that reason, if we look at it right, I just have a couple of the really you know some of the big packages we were just talking about. Um, with the federal uh, federal spending, and you know, roughly, you know, well, it's more than 5.5 trillion, you know, spent uh, by Treasury on these various packages. Um, and there's other other spending that's gone on as well, um, and certainly a whole enormous amount of uh, of, of efforts to, um, to to keep people whole, you know, such as you know, you know rent for uh, you know mortgage for forbearance, things of that nature. 
um, unemployment benefits have been extended to September. So you know, you have a lot of items uh, going on there. Um, and you know, the uh, University of Michigan's consumer sentiment number that I show there, um, what they in their survey uh, respondents say, cited strong economic growth, job gains, record stimulus spending, low interest rates, and strong rate of vaccinations for their more enthusiastic um, uh, view of, of things. Um, and of course, this is a, this is a bullish, uh, another bullish signal for gasoline demand. All right, so this is a good time to segue into um, the vaccination campaign. Uh, these numbers are fresh. You need to read the chart. The, the, the nearest is to the left, as opposed to what you normally would see. Um, the and this is recent data. Um, the, in the box, it's as effective as of uh, yesterday uh, with the vaccine doses, and you can just see, you know, how many have been delivered. Um, it's an incredible amount. Um, uh, but if we go back and let's take a look at the charts, you can see that big bump. You know, we had a second wave of COVID infections and deaths over the holidays. Um, this restrained driving demand for sure. Um, and in the U.S., there are still hot spots. Um, you know, Michigan is experiencing that. There's also some in New Jersey and other areas. Um, and there's, there is certainly concern that there could be new variants that could again swell the number of infections. And that's what we're seeing right now in India and Brazil. Um, India is just, uh, uh, locking down their, their large cities, and, and we could see more of that. Um, that is, you know, a real problem. But what is different, you know, in the U.S. against a country like India is that, you know, we are, as you can see by the left, I mean, we've administered over 215 million doses of the vaccine. Uh, the numbers are nowhere even close to that in, in India. Um, that is... The, uh, the pandemic is going to be around globally until the whole world gets a vaccine. Um, so that is something, of course, to be considered, especially if you're, uh, if you're an exporter. Um, and we've had some hiccups along the way in, in the United States, of course, you know, most recently with the J&J &J vaccine, you know, being, you know, the distribution of that vaccine being paused uh, because of some rare blood clots found in six individuals. Um, they're reviewing that. Um, and well, you know, apparently maybe that pause might be unpaused as early as tomorrow is, is the talk. So we'll see what happens on that. Um, but having said that, you know, we are seeing that strong growth in inoculations and that is really, you know, fantastic development. Um, we, as a country, we are quickly advancing towards what is referred to as herd immunity. Um, that is the point when a large majority of the population has become immune to the virus, either because they've been inoculated or they had the infection. Um, once that point is reached, the spread of the virus from person to person is unlikely. And that's when your pandemic um, ends. Um, reaching her herd, yeah, reaching herd immunity um, does vary, though, depending on the disease. And certainly there's been no textbook um, on this current COVID-19, which is spurring off numerous mutations um, globally. Um, but it's estimated that between 50 and 90 percent of the population would have needed to be vaccinated or have had the disease to reach that level. You know, the thinking is it's going to be at the upper end of that range. So we are, we could expect uh, to reach herd, herd immunity, quick, um, you know, in the second half of the year for sure, maybe as soon as June or July. But uh, We'll have to see. Um, and now what I want to take a look at is uh, DTN's uh, proprietary refined fuels demand data. And I have on the right side some high frequency data points. Um, you know, DTN's uh, refined fuels demand data captures real demand at the wholesale level. Um, and it does this in a timely way. Um, what I have Shown here to the left is is the is the change in actual gasoline demand. So this is literally measuring the volume of gasoline that's moving from the wholesale level. Um, and what I've have here, though, I have it in a percent basis. And what we can see is that you know we we struggled. I mean, you know, obviously we had the real big decline in demand um, 
which was what more than 40 percent um, a year ago um, and we could see it just flatlined and I'm sure many of you saw this we had some little ups and downs um, but very very the growth just stagnated and we even saw we could see the uh, with the Uriah cause with the decline there but we're shooting up um, and we're shooting up because of you know what we stated earlier uh, vaccines are rolling out and people are feel, feeling more comfortable and um, you also have um, you know states you know feeling more comfortable easing restrictions and that is having an effect now the on the right side you know with the uh, four uh, graphs um, are from the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention um, and it's showing this is high frequency data the the percents are are off uh, are, are compared against a, a baseline, a five-week baseline from January 3rd to February 6th, 2020. So what we can see is that, you know, certainly, you know, commutes to work are certainly down uh, countrywide, um, but we are seeing some growth, you know, some some smaller, shall we say, declines in stuff like body, retail and recreation activity. Um, the mobility index on the bottom, uh, quantifies how far users move each day with a reading of four equal to 10 kilometers or 6.2 miles. So uh, so as a country, um, we are moving about 6.2 miles uh, daily. Um, uh, and, you know, this is also like probably a good time to discuss, uh, you know, remote work when we go back to the top slide. Um, you know, the Labor Department uh, earlier this month reported that 21% of individuals teleworked in March, and that's down from 22.7% in February. But of course, the big question going forward is how, how you know, how durable is remote work? Um, a lot of talk certainly about that, and that is certainly a, you know, a major, you know, uh, a consideration for anybody selling gasoline. Um, ADP Research Institute reports that 44% of employers have incorporated an official flexible work policy. Now that's up from 24% before the pandemic. So this is clearly, you know, um, reaching uh, many, many individuals across the uh, country. Um, flexible work policies would include remote work. You know, this trend was actually taking place beforehand, but the pandemic accelerated it. Um, so uh, what we could see uh, following the pandemic um, is a scenario in which workers who were commuting to work five days a week may commute only two or three days a week uh, going forward. Um, that would certainly Limit the work commute number, which is why we watch an employment number like Hawks, you know, um, for uh, in trying to understand gasoline demand. Now, what's interesting though is not some studies have think you might see you know, vehicle miles traveled actually, you know, either hold flat and steady or even increase a little bit. And this um, thinking is is and there's been some studies on this even before the pandemic. Uh, this is being looked at. Um, the, the people who may be working at home um, may not just stay at home. Um, they may, you know, get up and do run errands, go to the store, and actually may even put on a few extra, you know, miles. Um, uh, and another scenario was with, you know, if you have those working full time, they may be able to move farther away from cities, and they may find while they're not commuting to work, you know, the trip to the store, you know, might be further away, or to go to gyms, or or just getting out of the house riding around, that those miles might increase. Um, and the one thing that's a little different, though, and you know, for anybody um, who's had a commute to a big city, I used to commute to Manhattan from Jersey, I could tell you, it was, I could never get that commute below one, an hour and a half. Um, uh, it, you, you know, you, you aren't sitting in traffic as much where, you know, we're, we're, we're guessing you're just, you know, just idling and burning fuel. Um, so, um, so, so there is a little bit of a difference there, but it is interesting to note that, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, if, if, if you, if all of a sudden 20% of the population is working remotely now, that guessing demand goes down 20%. That's not the, uh, that is not something I, I would, uh, is, is not expected to occur. And I think, you know, wherever your, your markets are um, geographically, um, you might even see upticks if, you know, if, if the populations are increasing in your area. Um, 
so it's an interesting thing, something to, uh, you know, we're going to keep on looking at, you know, my team market wire is going to keep on looking at that uh, going forward. Um, but where you are expected to see, you know, some longer term uh, effects, um, depressing activity or like center cities, um, which are going to see far less foot traffic than before the pandemic. Um, in fact, a, a recent survey conducted by the Partnership for New York City found that out of the 1 million office workers in Manhattan, only 10% returned to the office as of early March, and that number was unchanged from October. Um, it's expected to stay you know, around that number right through the summer months. Uh, by September, about 45% of those workers are expected to return to the office. Um, and employers that were surveyed expect 56% of their employees will work remotely at least part of the time post-pandemic. Um, so some interesting developments there. Um, now I'm just going to run through a few cities. Um, you know, our refined fuels demand uh, data is at, the is, is at the city level as well as the pad level. Um, but what this does is it allows us to better focus, you know, you know where there where there's growth, where that you know where there's growth that's outpacing the national average, um, and compare with other regions. Um, it's just phenomenal data. So we're looking at Houston. That's going to be our Texas uh, representative, and you know, and here on again there are the CD slides showing the um, you know some high frequency data statistics. Um, what we're seeing here, you know, gasoline demand. Again, this is this is this data. Uh, you know, our refined fuels demand data is a, um, I mean, this is based on actual gallons of gasoline moving from the wholesale distribution levels. This is, you're not going to find better demand data than this. Um, but that's showing you with that increase that we are, you know, Houston there reached nearly, you know, nearly reached 100% recovery there before dropping back a little bit. Um, uh, you know, Texas, you know, was a month ago, I want to say, um, you know, un, you know, opened up most of their businesses, um, and we could see with their with their work communities that. Uh, you know, and by the way, that is for Texas, not just for Houston on the right side. And you could see for Texas that uh, you know their the number of people are commuting are um, doing are more than than uh, the national average. Um, just this morning, the Department of Labor came up with an unemployment number, and claims in Texas fell. 23,357 last week. That was the biggest drop in their survey um, that they came out with this morning. Um, we, we moved to Detroit, which is going to represent our Michigan. Michigan stats are on the right side. You know, Michigan has had a little more of an issue. They are, you know, dealing with a, a sharp uh, increase in COVID cases. And you can see where they were, you know, you know, in Dornip. During the uh, initial lockdowns, uh, demand dropped more sharply in Detroit than, than elsewhere than the national average. And we saw that the recovery, you know, really, you know, surged. Uh, but it's coming back down a bit because of th these higher cases of COVID um, in the area. And in today's numbers, of course, the unemployment numbers, uh, while well, Texas is declining, unemployment, first time unemployment claims in Michigan increased by over uh, by near by, by 5,400. So, um, so there, so there you can see some of the differences, and it's clearly uh, reflected in our demand data. Um, now we go to Jacksonville, Florida, certainly another large state. The state's been in the news a lot um, for a number of reasons, and we can see you know a sharp uptick in gasoline demand. And again, their work commute for Florida is is better than the national average. Um, and, you know, again, you know, they were, um, today, you know, last week, unemployment claims in Florida, um, declined by more than 8,000. So, you know, these numbers are sort of lining up. You can see our demand data, high frequency data, and even the, you know, the, you know, the weekly delays from the Department of Labor all kind of lining up, um, giving us a, a nice view of market conditions. And for our last, uh, you know, representative, we're looking at Los Angeles um, with the stats on the right for the California, for California. Um, 
the work commute in California is, is well uh, is, is down significantly, um, well above the national average, which you can see here. Um, their uh, unemployment uh, initial unemployment claims did increase nearly 3,000 last week, but I will, would note that uh, the prior week they were down significantly. Um, so maybe we'll see some improvements here. They're looking for a June 15th timeline and fully reopening their economy, or it's conditional. But anyway, we can see the mobility index also trailing the uh, the national average a little bit. So, so there is um, you know kind of a combination of looking at a number of various statistics and trying to uh, you know trying to understand um, you know you know the market strength. And now we're going to take a look at our summer outlook. Um, what I have on the screen here is, you know, first the first slide um, that we saw with summer demand, um, but uh, I, I swapped out the three-year average and put the energy information short-term, you know, their, their outlook in this, uh, their short-term energy outlook came out earlier this month, and that is, you know, it's an average, so it's flat, you know, flatlining, but you can see that we're already there, um, and that is not encouraging for the overall growth if we were expecting this really, really sharp trend we saw the past couple of weeks to continue, but, you know, at least it's positive. Uh, they are certainly seeing a big jump against uh, a year ago, uh, but when you compare it to summer 2019, you know, we're still down 7% based on their expectations. Um, and you can see the numbers where they see uh, demand peaking, um, you know, in August, um, at 9.1 million barrels, but again, you know, that's that's down pretty sharply against uh, 2019. Uh, so positive, um, we're, we're, we're seeing growth, but, you know, the, these expectations are, 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 are being capped by uh, expectations that people are going to continue to work from home, and that's going to overall limit the overall growth rate. So uh, just something to, to consider. Um, and you see if we'll see if they're right or not, but uh, we'll certainly be monitoring that with my market wire uh, right through the whole summer. Um, so let's get let's take a look at some pricing dynamics. Um, so this is a chart uh, for the Arbob contract. You know, it's a gasoline contract. Um, and we had a strong run from November all, all the way up to March. Uh, we gave a little bit of that back, um, but you can see, you know, we, you know, we we reached this 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 high of 217 in March, March 15th, um, and we kind of came back down a little bit. There were several reasons for for that surge. You know, winter storm Urea was certainly part of that uh, in pushing that higher, as well as OPEC Plus as their restraint um, and their comments. In, in holding back crude, their crude production. You know, their meeting, um, their more recent meeting, they are gonna start adding those bar some barrels back to the market over the, you know, right through July, um, but they're seeing to have it tempered a bit. Um, the market likes that. Um, the uh, the growth was also seen because of the vaccine, vaccinations and, you know, all this stuff we, or we just went through. Um, so there's some definitely some bullish um, expectations, but that, that five month uptrend is kind of stalled. Um, I mean, if you look at that, you know, we, we, we just slipped below the, uh, the, the trend line to the trend line for that uh, yesterday. We settled below that. If that keeps on happening, um, we're not going to, uh, you know, we, we, we very well could see the, 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 the high for the Arbob contract uh, could very well be in. So we 217 might be the high uh, for the year. It's, um, so that's kind of what I'm seeing here. Um, that's what I'm expecting. Um, going forward. Now, on the bottom uh, stack, um, this is this chart's made of profit X. Um, the bottom stack, the the, uh, the histogram, those gray bars are um, are Bob minus uh, the price of West Texas Intermediate futures, and the green bar is or the green yeah the green not the bar but the green line is um, R Bob minus the Brent contract. Um, now, the EIA in their outlook, they're anticipating. That you know the uh, they're anticipating that the uh, the Brent crack spread is going to hold about um, at about the eighteen dollar ninety cent area. So um, so we're a little below that now, but um, but that's something to consider. Um, you know we we're, we're, we we kind of 
it, you know, it, 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 it increasingly appears that, you know, you know, we've, we, we got this excitement about, about progress in the market and we rallied on that, but some of the realities are really coming home uh, to kind of slow the enthusiasm, if you will. Um, I would note too that, you know, when you're talking, you know, when, when, when the RBOB contract and, um, you know, gets above $2.10, um, holds there for a while, then you're talking about $3 per gallon gasoline um, nationally. So that is a big number. And sometimes, you know, um, those higher prices could also dent demand, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Now, let's just say, you know, you, you got to always be careful of markets, right? Because they, they do change and change in a dime. So let's just say, you know, that my outlook right there is, is incorrect. Um, well, you know, I went back and I took a look at, um, those lines, those percentages, that's a Fibonacci retracement. It's a technical uh, application that you can look to review markets. We have our trend line, and this is a weekly chart right here. Um, and we're looking, and you know, on a weekly basis, we're still, we're, we're still in that trend line. So, you know, it hasn't really, you know, broken down yet. But if we got past that 217, you know, number, what are we looking at? And I would submit that we're probably going to get, you know, up to that 229 area, 230 area, if that happens. Um, I'm uh, just not so sure, but if it does here, you know, it's, it, you know, there, there it is, you know, that's where, you, where we might go. Um, doubt would get much higher. It's just, it, it, so many things would have to happen. It's a little too soon. Um, and uh, as we stated for the numerous reasons, it's very unlikely, but I, I think the max you're going to see is, is up to that upper 220s. But I, if that happens, I still, but I'm going to still submit that the 217 is likely the, uh, may very well be the candidate for the high. Um, so here, let's go, we're taking, going now back, um, this is our last content slide. So we're taking a look back at the, uh, you know, uh, the IA short-term energy outlook to get some retail prices. And when you take a look at this, I mean, you know, there, it's kind of, when you look at that July price of 278 number, that, that, that indicate, that would suggest as well that, you know, Arbot Futures has hit, has hit a high, um, you know, if they're right, you know. Um, uh, and uh, already, you know, we look at there that 278 that the average that they see for July. I mean, on Monday the average was two two dollars and eighty five five two point eight five five. Um, so you know, we're already at that July price. So um, uh, so this price wise, you know, not seeing you know much more upside um, with that. Um, like I said, the others you know, we're watching so many different dynamics both. Uh, domestically and, and internationally, that that could change in a heartbeat. Uh, but anyway, that's where we sit now. And on that, I'm going to pass it back to Shannon for questions. I want to thank everybody for 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 listening um, to me, and I do look forward to addressing your questions. Shannon. Yes, thanks, Brian. So just a reminder: if you have a question, please submit it in the lower right hand corner of your screen under the Q and A section. In the meantime, we do have a few, Brian. So, first off, what happens to demand if more companies call workers back to the to their offices? That would be um, a bullish development. It would, uh, you know, as we're looking, it, it would it would accelerate, um, you know, the, the the amount of people that are you know going to be on the roads, um, and uh, and and that trend might also prompt other companies to do the same thing. So that would speed up. Or that would, you know, clearly increase, uh, you know, gasoline demand uh, going forward. All right, and, and the second one, what would happen, um, do you think, to gasoline demand if we had a third wave of COVID infections? Yeah, it goes the other way. Uh, you know, it's, you know, we saw it during um, the second wave over the holiday period, and also, you know, we noted the holiday period that the vaccines were just rolling out uh, mid early December. You know, with the uh, you know, Pfizer BioNTech, and then uh, you know, quickly followed by the Moderna virus, uh, you know, vaccines. Um, so, so there was a little bit of that hesitation. Um, but I think a third, well, I think a third wave would, would certainly depress uh, gasoline demand. It might not be as dramatic as what we saw in the second wave. There is clearly, you know, pandemic fatigue, if you will. Um, and I think also, as we know, the uh, you know, the, the likelihood of that might not be as strong considering, you know, how high we get in the vaccination rates, but it would have, it would dent demand. And I, 
it, it could prompt also, um, you know, some states to, um, you know, to restrict some mobility activity, um, and that 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 would, uh, you know, that could, uh, you know, harm demand. I would say, you know, um, that there was um, another survey. There's so many surveys out there, you know, to look at. So you've got to be careful about what you're looking at. But uh, but there was one survey that found that. Um, States with stricter lockdowns, um, or I should say, states without lockdowns, I should say, um, they, they still, the majority of people still, you know, uh, practice, you know, social distancing and, and, and limit their mobility, um, but their demand would have been about 10% stronger than states with the strict lockdowns. Um, but I, that would, you know, hopefully it does not happen. Um, but um, but but should it but should it I think well I think Michigan is is, is an example right there you know, we're starting to see you know unemployment numbers now again climbing um, they're not expected to have lockdowns um, to any sort of uh, extreme in Michigan as they did before uh, but still you know we saw gasoline the demand drop off so if that did happen we would we, we should expect another hit to demand. Okay, thank you. And then a few more of it have popped in here. So how much has drilling in the USA? Declined since Biden took power. Okay, well, let's see. Um, let me grab my stats because we have new stats here. Yeah, drilling. Well, let me see here. Since he took power, um, it's down. I mean, right. Uh, you know, last week, uh, well, actually, for uh, for April, it's at 11 million barrels per day um, domestic uh, drilling. Um, that's where it's averaged over the past four weeks, as a matter of fact. And uh, that compares, that's down 11.8% um, against a year ago. Now, as far as, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't quite, uh, drilling is, it was down deeper, um, but it's not so much just because of what Biden's policy is. There, you're seeing uh, exploration and production companies, um, especially your shale oil, oil drillers, practicing more restraint and more discipline in, um, in 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 their drilling before where where they were borrowing furiously to keep on drilling and those numbers just rocketed higher um, uh, those days are supposedly gone um, you're hearing that frequently for a number of the uh, analysts who closely follow your drilling companies I and mean, we're kind of seeing in the numbers um, the Baker Hughes camp the Baker Hughes uh, weekly recount you know, it has been showing, you know, gains in the rig, in the rigs. Um, but uh, I guess something else that's also missing is that um, the rigs are more efficient these days, too, so they can produce more than they did before. But I, I think, um, I think looking forward, you know, I think you could see Biden's policies, you know, limit any sort of upside. Um, of course, there's already some, you know, they're watching drilling on federal lands. Um, there are going to be some limitations. So that could definitely be, um, you know, a restraint, go, uh, restraint going forward, or, or how, or how some of the climate policies that are coming out of uh, D.C. under his administration, you know, how they might affect it. Uh, right now, I, I, I wouldn't say it had um, any real huge effect, but it's still early in the game here. So uh, it is something um, to watch. And um, and you know it it, it could you know we, we we could see we could see uh, you know more you know more you know drilling output to decline a little more going forward if um, if some of those more uh, I don't want to call them I'm trying to think of a proper word for it um, but some of the policies that are you know in the Green New Deal for instance that was reintroduced. Um, you know, those policies would certainly, you know, you know, slice a lot of the production if, if they ever came, sure. came true. Sure. All right. Here's, here's another question for you. What happens to our Bob prices in the U.S. if global demand lessens, but U.S. continues to set the trend of economic recovery? Okay. Okay. Good question. Well, we're see, we saw a little bit of that um, with that run up. Um, because the U.S. was outperforming and continued to out outperform most of the world. Um, but we should remember, too, that um, 
we, we export a lot. We export gasoline. We act, we're we're a net. The United States is a net exporter of oil products. Um, let's see. We have uh, you know this last week we have we've been running somewhere between like uh, you know 600 to 800,000 barrels per day of gasoline being exported. If 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 the markets we sell to, and gasoline is mostly exported like a short haul, like through, uh, you know, to, uh, to to Mexico or to South America. Um, if, uh, if 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 they're not taking in those barrels, you know, that will limit the overall, you know, strength of of, of our bob. Um, I think, uh, you know, what, yeah, you know, that's 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 really your key element. There's going to just going to be those gallons, those barrels that. Are just going to sit sit uh, sit in the U.S. instead of going elsewhere, which would which would limit the overall strength and prices um, for our bond. Okay. Um, in in kind of related, I think, in your opinion, how much of the RBOB demand recovery we are seeing is due to sustainable demand or due to COVID fatigue? Oh no, I think I I think um, I, I do think this is. Well, sustainable, but kind of where we're at, right? You know, the, the growth. You know, so 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 you, you definitely. I think you saw we, we were just showing our refined fuels demand data. How you saw those big spikes, and then it kind of backed off a little bit. I think that big spikes, you know, was that you know that that release that you know uh, that last. You know, here we go. I'm, I'm alive again, feeling great. Um, I think you saw that, but but I think. Um, I think uh, you know going forward, we're, we're, we're kind of following that area. I think it's going to plateau out here right now. Um, and uh, so to get the question right, um, as far as going, I, 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 so I, I do think you know with the trends we're seeing as far as where we're at are sustainable. I just think you know the growth rate going forward is is not as high. And I think that is you know, part, a little because of the COVID fatigue, but also I think a bigger part of that is because of high level of vaccinations people feel are feeling more comfortable going out um, going out to a restaurant so those are a big deal I think you know that will help accelerate it and if it wasn't for the employment with the, with the lack of remote work um, I think you would see the um, you know that demand number grow even more so I hope I answered the question um, there okay and how has um, COVID affected U.S. exporting yeah, put a damper on it for sure. Um, uh, but uh, when we're starting to look at, let me just take a quick look at a chart. I'm a charts guy, so I, I always love to look at my charts uh, for reference here. Um, you know, uh, what we have here, yeah, yeah, I just, I just took a picture and I recall. So what, what we have is, while, while the export numbers are, 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 have, been, have been pressured a little bit um, because of that, um, our import rate for gasoline has actually increased recently. Um, and why is that? Um, it's because, you know, Europe is sending us gasoline. Um, they have more gasoline that they can use. Um, we're priced at a higher level. So, you know, they're, they're, they're sending it to us. In fact, uh, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe, maybe it was three weeks ago, um, gasoline imports on the East Coast reached a 10-year high. Um, that's where most gasoline imports are received. Um, you know, that, that is a little bit murky too with the export number. I mean, cl clearly we're selling less barrels overall. Um, if we have a situation where you look at India, for instance, um, and if they really dial back the demand and their demand was growing pretty strongly there, but if their demand dials back because of the mobility restrictions they're putting in place now, you know, your crude exports will take a hit. Um, uh, let me see here. Um, but I, I mean, when we look at this, I'm, I'm sneaking, I'm taking a look at another chart here because I, so I have to go find it. <laughs> this is data right here. I said, I want to answer the question as best as I can here. But we look at our, yeah, see, okay. So our total export numbers are, are definitely uh, trending down against a year ago. They have been since the beginning of the year. And that's, because there is just that, that, that globally demand is off. I mean, we, we're growing globally for sure, but we're still below the levels we were before the uh, the pandemic hit. So, and this and here it goes where you know we it's a small world as they say, right? You know, we we need the whole world to be to get 
you'll reach her, herd immunity before we finally get rid of this, this, um, you know, this, this pandemic um, overall. And that's going to keep a, keep a lid on exports because, you know, countries are simply not going to buy the, the you know, I say country, but obviously the companies within a country are simply not going to buy the, you know, you know, U.S. products if they don't have the demand for it. Um, so that's an issue. But we are, we've been we're definitely down um, against the uh, against a year ago up to this point. And now now we're now we're going to start hitting where we're in COVID starting to impact it. So so that so we'll start trending above a year ago on the next couple of weeks. When we look at the three-year average against that, and you know, I'm looking at crude and petroleum products total. Um, you know, we've been bouncing around the three-year average. Um, we're starting to get back to it. A big dent, and, and why this is also a little blurry is because of what happened with winter storm Uriah, with you know, the, the, the exports and imports, everything was affected. Um, couldn't get out. You couldn't get some supply out of the ports down there uh, for a while. But um, but we, you know, kind of dancing around that three-year average a little. So not terrible, but remember we we're seeing really strong growth uh, before the pandemic. So it's um, so a little depressed. I think that's just something to, to really keep watching going forward. I think that will recover, but again, we might be, you know, talking six months, nine months out before we really start seeing some you know, real serious growth there. Great, thank you. And I we're running up on the top of the hour here, and there was a few questions we didn't have a chance to get to. And we will try and reach out to you directly and, and answer that. So um, thank you everyone for joining us today. We a big thanks to Brian for, for walking us through all of this information. And we'll be sending out uh, the rebroadcast link shortly. And you'll also be able to access it from our DTN.com website. So thank you everyone and thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much.